Hey everybody, welcome to the Renaissance Woodworker Shop update for December 16th, 2016. What's been happening in my shop this week? Sticking moldings, lots of moldings. It's frankly one of the things that I enjoy most about hand tool woodworking, yet it's also one of the things that seems most mysterious, one of the things that confuses the most people, and there's this misconception that it's really difficult advanced hand tool woodworking. It's just not the case. For the last week, I've been putting together moldings for my blanket chest. I've also been sticking some moldings to create some picture frames for Christmas gifts. And I've just been posting pictures to my social feeds throughout the week and I've been getting a lot of questions. So this week, I wanted to answer some of those questions and really just address hand sticking moldings using molding planes. It's kind of a way to get into them and dispel some of the myths that you've got to have a whole ton of planes and a whole ton of skill to do this. It's relatively easy work. It involves creating some rabbits and just rounding them over. So let's talk a little bit about the planes to begin with, because I know a lot of people get stuck here. You can look at my tool cabinet behind me and see why that might happen. I've got a lot of molding planes. The entire top shelf of my tool cabinet is dedicated to hollow and round planes. I've got some joinery planes down here, but then a bunch more molding planes on the other side. So even in my small little tool cabinet, I've got two shelves dedicated to them and about 20 different molding planes. Now, the half set that I have up top refers to my hollows and rounds. Hollow and round planes are numbered one through 18. Each number corresponds to a 16th of an inch. The number one has a blade that's a 16th of an inch wide. The number two, two sixteenths or one eighth of an inch wide. And it progresses up from there until you get to the higher planes, in which case the numbers actually go up more than in the sixteenth. And it has to do with the arc of the circle and it gets a little bit technical in geometry and I don't wanna go into that right now. So really the best way, the clearest way to think of it is, is each number corresponds to a sixteenth of an inch. So the number six hollow refers to three eighths of an inch. Six sixteenths reduced to three eighths of an inch. Then you've got snipes bill planes and you've got rabbiting planes. Then you've got complex molders like side beads or dedicated planes that represent an entire profile, like an ovalo or a cavetto or an OG or a reverse OG or classical profile or any number of different profiles. Think about a modern day router bit set. All of those different decorative profiles could exist in a complex plane that has a complex geometry in the bottom that specifically cuts that specific profile. But here's the beauty of this, the hollows and round planes where you just have a convex and a corresponding or mating concave shape of the same size, those can, turn, can create any of these complex profiles. And that's really why the hollows and rounds are the, the heart of the whole thing. The good news is they're also incredibly common and you can find them in antique stores all over the place. You can also find a lot of these complex molders and I do have a couple of them because there are some profiles that I just use over and over and over again. The ovalo is a good example and I've got three different sized ovalos because I just love that particular profile. But you can see how quickly this gets out of control and you think, man, I can't get into molding planes. I've got to have, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 of them. Look at pictures of old joiner shops and you'll see walls and walls of these planes. Let's eliminate the complex molders from this. Don't get me wrong, I like them as much as the next guy, but I think if you're going to get into sticking your moldings by hand and thinking from a modern sensibility, you'll find that three planes is all you're going to need. First and foremost is the rabbit plane. Square bottom, it cuts rabbits. We have modern day rabbits made by Veritas. Some might call them philisters. You also can have modern reproductions of wooden moving philisters that cuts a really wide rabbit and it's got a fence and a depth stop. The basic form of that is just this plain old square bottom rabbit plane. Now this has a skewed iron on the bottom, which means it cuts really well across the grain as well as with the grain. 
The molding planes, the, the rabbit planes that I like to use for moldings have a square aspect. They don't have skewed. And that's because when you're cutting a molding, you're working with the grain and I don't really need that skewed aspect to cut cleanly. I also find that it's a little bit easier to start a square rabbit in nothing but a gauge line. And I've shown that in some of my videos before on using rabbit planes. You also can take a look at those videos and see just how much I love these fenceless rabbit planes. They're incredibly powerful tools. Well, 90% of hand sticking a molding is done with a rabbit plane. The, mold, the molding profile is set up using a series of rabbits of different depths, different widths, widths set in strategic places. Once you have all those rabbits cut, then you come back with a hollow to create the bead shapes and a round to create the cove shapes. And I suggest that a pair of sixes, a six hollow and a six round, can create the entire set. Remember that set of router bits I was talking about? You buy them on eBay for $19.99. You can create all the profiles in that kit with a pair of number sixes. And the reason for that, again, the number six, six sixteenths, reduces to three eighths, corresponds to half the thickness of a three quarter inch board. Most of our stuff nowadays is three quarters of an inch thick. There's lots of reasons for that, but I don't think you can deny the fact that most of the wood we're working with is three quarters of an inch thick. If you're putting decorative profiles and moldings around tabletops, a lot of times it's three quarters of an inch thick. So if you wanted to create a round over that was the top half of a three quarter inch thick tabletop, you could grab a 3 8 inch or a number six hollow and create that round over that perfectly bisects that 3 quarter inch board. If I wanted to create an OG, so I've got a bead and a cove or a reverse OG which would have the cove and the bead, you're dividing that 3 quarter inch top in half. Guess what? It's 3 eighths of an inch. 3 eighths of an inch hollow, 3 eighths of an inch round and you have an OG. You can use the rabbit plane to create those square steps called fillets spaced in between the hollow and the round. You can create classical profiles set on either side of the hollow, you get an ovalo. Set on either side of the round, you get a cavetto profile. You can create a whole bunch of them. Now they're all essentially the same size, but again, based on that 3 8 inch multiple of 3 quarters, it pretty much works out in just about any profile you want to create. Now I'm not going to claim you can create any profile under the sun, and that's where some other sizes will come to bear. But unless you're creating enormous moldings, gooseneck moldings, and huge crowns, you rarely will need to get into these big guys, the 16s and 18s and even 14s. Most of the work we're going to do could fall into a number four, number six, and number eight. If you really wanted to have a full set, I'd say four, six, and eight, and you'd be good to go. But if you just wanted to get into this and try it out, get yourself a pair of sixes and a rabbit plane, and that's all you really need. So let me reiterate the whole idea of a single pair of hollows and rounds. This is probably one of my favorite profiles. It's a 3 8 inch ovalo. What I've got is a fillet up top, fillet at the bottom. Those were created with a regular rabbit plane. This first fillet, the rabbit was dropped. Then there was another rabbit dropped on the very top to create this top fillet. Then I came in with a six hollow plane to create the cove. And now I have an ovalo. It's done with really the rabbit and the number six hollow. This OG was done with a number six round and a number six hollow. I created a series of rabbits to remove the bulk of the waste. A series of rabbits flanking this hollow will actually provide kind of rails for the, hollow to ride, for the round to ride on and it creates that cove. A chamfer that creates two arises on either side of that chamfer gives the hollow plane rails to ride on to create this ovalo shape. Again, a pair of number sixes did that work. This classical profile is basically the same thing as this reverse OG, but now there's a fillet in between. So I've just created another rabbit in between, in between to create that sharp 90 degree corner, that shadow line, and a number six round and a number six hollow. Something a little bit more complex is this molding I'm making for a picture frame. Now I've got 
This round over on the back side here was done with a number six hollow. This cove in the middle was done with a number six round. But now I've got a cove that's scribing a 90 degree arc instead of the typical 60 degree arc that we see here. Because each one of these hollows scribes 60 degree arc of a circle. Remember back to our geometry class, a 60 degree arc segment of a circle is also equal to the radius of that circle. So if I've got a 3 8 inch plane, I'm going to scribe a 60 degree arc that's 3 8 of an inch wide. So in order to get that 90 degree arc, I've got to make a pass up, turn on the top of that, and then turn it and make a pass on the bottom. So it's a dramatically different looking cove, but it's still based on the 3 8 inch radius. Just I'm scribing a wider arc there. I've got a fillet down here that was done with a rabbit plane. The only difference up top here is this bead that was created with my number six, <clears throat> my number six hollow, but instead of taking the full 60 degree arc, I did a shorter arc to create one side of it, and then I flipped it over to create the other side of that. This could have been done easier with a smaller radius profile, like a number four or a number two, but frankly, I was able to do the same thing with that number six, and then, frankly, I came back with a card scraper and just kind of smoothed out a facet that was left right on top. But I've got this much more elaborate looking picture frame molding that was done with just those three planes, the rabbit and the pair of sixes. So you've got your pair of six hollows and rounds. You've got a rabbit plane. What do I do now? Well, you're going to need a mallet to adjust that in and out, but any old mallet will do for that, as long as it's super lightweight, because you don't need a lot of pressure to advance these tiny little irons. And then you're going to need a sticking board. And I've specifically gotten questions about the sticking board and specifically my sticking board in the past. And there's really nothing to it. The sticking board is essentially your workbench, uh, kind of an auxiliary workbench for sticking moldings. In this case, it's just some Home Depot poplar. It's a piece of uh, one by eight that has two one by threes screwed down on top of it. This is the fence that holds the board against the lateral pressure. And then I've got a series of screws down here on the other end that act as stops. And I can screw these in or out to raise and lower the stops. So when I take a molding blank like this and I slide it down the board, it hits those screws and I'm firmly held in place in two directions. Because when I'm using my rabbit plane in this instance, as I'm running along here, I've obviously got force up against those stops, directly opposite the direction of the plane. And that's what those screws do. But you also find you're exerting force laterally, this way. As I'm holding this plane up against the wall and making that cut, I'm pushing the board up against this tall fence. Likewise, when I'm actually wanting to round this over and I'm using my hollow plane, I'm exerting a fair amount of pressure up against this fence. If you notice, the plane is cocked down at an angle here. And I am pushing right up against that fence. And there's actually very little pressure against the screws at this point. Now you may be thinking, well, why do you have so many screws and why do you need to raise and lower them? Well, in this particular case, we're always starting with a blank that's wider than what we need. We can stick a molding profile here. Once it's created, we can come in and rip it off with a saw. And that's where we get a stick of molding, like this classical profile. I then sawed it off, and now I'm set up to create another profile. And the board has shrunk. So I've got the capacity to hold the six inch wide board here and stick quite a few moldings. Well, as I'm working further and further back, I want support all the way up to the edge of that molding. So in this particular case, I would want these stops raised a little bit so that I've got support right up to where I'm working. But at the same time, I need to make sure that this stop stays out of the way of my plane. So in this case, this round was working right along here and it was coming right up to the edge. And you can see my plane is going to bump into that screw. That's not going to work. So I have to screw this down. It's still providing support right out to the point, but now it's below the surface of my plane as I finish up that round. And once I rip this out, 
the whole blank gets shorter. So I'm taking these screws and they're slightly countersunk and they're just completely out of the way. Likewise, I don't need this screw here, although I suppose I could keep it up a little bit, but I've got plenty of support with the rest of these screws. As I continue to stick moldings and saw them away, this board gets narrower and narrower and narrower until you, know, you might end up with just this last little piece out here. I'm sticking a molding right there up against the fence and I've got all of these screws down except for this last one here. Certainly, I'm oversimplifying a little bit here. There's a little bit more theory to creating different moldings with the same pair of hollows and rounds, but honestly, most of it comes down to layout. And I find that just taking some time to deconstruct the molding with a series of rabbits and figuring out how I'm gonna balance my hollows and rounds on those rabbits, I can create just about any molding profile. Most of the time, I'll just draw out a full scale model and take my actual wrap, my hollow or round, hold it up to that model and figure out where it's gonna work on there. Other times, I'll actually use my hollow and round to lay out the profile on the wood. So you can use things like circle templates and stuff like that to scribe these arcs, but I find one of the most useful things to do is just take the plane, lay it on the end, trace that profile, and now I've got an arc that perfectly matches the plane I'll be using to cut it with. And you can put together all kinds of different profiles just by using your planes to lay them out. Probably the, the best thing you can do is pick up Matt Bickford's book. Matt is the, the plane maker that made My Hollows and Rounds at MS Bickford. His book put up by Lost Art Press, oh shoot, I just forgot the name, Moldings in Practice, I think, that's right. Go to Lost Art Press and you'll find the molding book. It will tell you how all of this works, how the rabbits uh, lay out and guide the planes. He also gives you the diagrams, if you will, to create a whole bunch of these molding profiles. But here's the thing. Unless you are exactly reproducing antique profiles, there's no reason to have a whole boatload of these planes. Eventually you'll get just you'll feel the siren song of hand stuck moldings like I have and you'll start to acquire more planes. But there's no reason to hold you back from getting started right away. You can go to any antique store and pick up a set of hollows and rounds. You can go to eBay and pick up a pair of hollows and rounds. You can even make your own. I hope that answers some of the questions. I've got several videos already on my site where I have created specific molding profiles and I go into more detail about how the rabbits are laid out, how the rabbits guide the plane. So I urge you to check out some of my other hand stuck molding links. If nothing else, I've got a whole lesson on creating hand stuck moldings in semester two of the Hand Tool School. That's all for me this week, folks. You might notice this dust collector filter sitting in the back. I talked about that last week. The dust right filter did come in, so I'll be installing that, and we'll probably take a look at that next week.